All right. Um, now, if there's any membership candidates here, I'm not going to ask you in front of everybody, but I hope everybody's happy with their results. And um, uh, I feel like they've got what they wanted to out of membership just because passing is not the objective. It is learning and you would have done a lot of that regardless of what the outcome was. So try and focus on that. And in hindsight, seven years down the track, I can say very confidently that failing my fellowships first time around was very good for my knowledge the mm. second time around. So it's always, there's always a benefit to it, even if it feels crap. Um, so well done, everybody, for getting through it. Um, we are up to pancreatitis or the pancreas in Edinburgh. And this will be the last section from the gastrointestinal tract. So this session, we're going to talk about the pancreas. So a bit of physiology, what the different enzymes do and stuff. Um, obviously, pancreatitis is the most common disease we see associated with the pancreas, but we will dip into a bit of EPI as well. Um, and then next fortnight, I've got it set aside for doing some case studies. So pretty much everything we've talked about in the last two months has been vomiting and diarrhea. And there's really nice ways of kind of investigating cases like that um, and looking at some ultrasound images and stuff like that. So this will be a good audio one for people just listening in, but the, in a fortnight, it's going to be a little bit more visual. So um, try and set aside some time to watch the images if you're tuning in next fortnight. Um, all right. So what is the function of the pancreas? What are the functions of the pancreas, I should say? Exocrine and endocrine. Excellent. When you look at the kind of um, anatomy of the pancreas, which of those sections takes up the majority of space in the pancreas? Uh, the uh, Exocrine does. Exocrine, exactly right. Yeah, so the islets only take up 2% of the volume of the pancreas. Um, so very small component, but obviously very important component because they produce insulin. And that is absolutely essential. Um, okay, so if we've got 98% exocrine pancreas, what is the exocrine pancreas doing? Producing digestive enzymes, but I, I was going to leave that one to the young fellas. Yeah. You don't want me to ask you what the function of amylase is? Um, I won't. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, now, Josh is skiing, so we can't, I don't have him to pick on today. Is anybody else willing to um, play with me? No hands up today. Yeah, I think there's still. Um, I think protein digestion for amylase. Amylase? Yeah. Ooh, close. It's one of the digestions. Thanks, Bron. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm pushing you. <laughs> um, so, amylase. So, let's list the enzymes that we know first, and then we'll talk about what they, what they do. Um, so, amylase is one. Lipase. Good. Um, Oh. Trypsinogen. Very good. Very, very good. Okay, so they're the big three. So if we look at lipase, what's that digesting? Fat. Fat. Yeah, good. Exactly. It's got a nice hint in the name. So the um, A's at the end means changing something. So an enzyme identifies an enzyme which changes the form of something. So we've got lipase changes the form of fat. Um, into smaller molecules, macromolecules into smaller molecules. Um, and then we've got amylase, and it's not protein. Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, exactly. So the complex carbohydrates at starch, it breaks down into smaller um, components. And then trypsinogen. That's a zymosin. It gets converted to trypsin when it gets activated. Yep. Yeah. And what does it digest? That is the one that does protein, I think. Yes, exactly. So we've got trypsin for protein, amylase for starch, and lipase for fat. So they're the big three. Um, so what we know the kind of components of the, the pancreas, if you had to break, like if you had to eat a pancreas, no, let's not eat a pancreas. If we had to, sorry. <laughs> uh, if we had to look at what 
um, nutrients are in a pancreas, what are we going to find in there? Like nutritional value wise. Maybe the enzymes. Like, is that what you're Yeah. Doing? Yeah. I was thinking more like what, what, um, what macronutrients would there be if you were going to eat it? It's, I guess it's mostly glandular, a glandular organ. So I don't know. Mm, I have no idea. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not asking the question well enough, but essentially like the pretty much all tissue in the body is made up of protein and fat, right? And mm-hmm. water. Yeah. So if you've got an organ that contains things which are designed to break, break down protein and fat, why isn't it eating itself? Oh. Well, because oh, it has a certain it's made of, mechanism. Where... Made of connective tissue. <laughs> yeah, so there is some connective tissue in there, but uh, um, if if it was allowed to just kind of, if that trypsin amylase and lipase were able to just interact with the tissue without any safety measures in there, it would just, um, all that would be left would be connective tissue. Mm. Um, so what protective mechanisms are there to stop the pancreas from autodigestion? It's called. Uh, the enzymes are... Uh, mm like trypsinogen, the ogens yeah. stop them from exhibiting their action and they have to be stimulated to have that ox- action by like um, CCK and stuff. Excellent. But- yes. So trypsinogen is stored in an inactive mm-hmm. form. So trypsinogen doesn't have any activity. Trypsin digests protein. Uh-huh. So at some point along the way, trypsinogen is converted to trypsin. And you're right, Alison, nice to see your face again. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, you're right about the being activated by things. Um, did you say CCK? Oh, I've lost your voice. Uh, is it cholecystokinin from the... Um, I I don't have cholecystokinin on my list, but it might be. Okay. Um, the main one is enterokinase. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who did you say that, Pooja? Well done. Yeah. So where is enterokinase? In the duodenum. Good. Exactly. It's produced by the brush border. So that means that trypsin can't trypsinogen can't be activated to trypsin until it gets into the duodenum. So it can't digest the pancreas. Um, what other mechanisms are there? Do you mean mechanisms to protect the pancreas from exactly. itself? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a couple of um, couple that I get too excited about fellowship level ones. <laughs> so I'm sorry if we get a bit deep here. Um, but there's a genetic mutation that's been identified. In what breed is most predisposed to, to um, pancreatitis? Schnauzers. Good, excellent. Okay. So there's a genetic mutation that's been identified in Schnauzers and it relates to one of these protective mechanisms. So I'm like, ooh. Is it <laughs> got something to do with hyperlipidemia? Uh, it doesn't actually, which is oh, interesting okay. because they also have that as one of the, the triggers. Um, uh, so, so what stops the trypsin in the duodenum going back up the pancreatic duct? And ah, the little oddy. Good. Um, good. Yeah. The sphincter. Yeah. So there's so a sphincter got there. And flow. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So with a one-way flow, I would write down as one of the mechanisms okay. to stop autodigestion. Um, do you guys know what inactivates trypsin? Mm. No. Have you heard of antitrypsin? Maybe. So, what about a, I don't know, somatostatins stop everything. 
<laughs> to put a statin in the name. It's just yeah, put a statin. Put a statin. Put a yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know about, about a statin. It's not on my list. I just pulled it out. It's like it's a stat. Yeah. Um, so when I was training, um, it's probably close to 15 years ago, we used to give plasma to every dog with pancreatitis who was um, had systemic inflammation. And the reason, the justification that we used to do that was that plasma contains antitrypsin. So it actually binds and inhibits trypsin in circulation. Um, so it decreases that kind of um, amount of trypsin that's activated in the system where it shouldn't be. Is there a pancreatic inhibitor, like trypsin secretory inhibitor, something like that? Yes, which is the new name of antitrypsin. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excellent, yeah. <laughs> so just confusingly, they change the name and then you think, is there two, is there one? And then you're reading an old paper and now you're reading a new paper. Um, but they call it um, serine protease inhibitor. Oh, no, sorry, alpha-1 protease inhibitor now. Um, and it used to be called alpha-1 antitrypsin, so alpha-1 protease inhibitor. Um, so that scavengers trypsin in the bloodstream. Um, and then inside the asinar cells, there's this serine protease inhibitor, Kazal type 1, which is a ridiculous name. So we call it SPINK, S-P-I-N-K. Serine protease inhibitor, Kazal type 1. So SPINK. Um, in schnauzer, so this is this is something that inhibits trypsin. So if trypsinogen happens to get activated to trypsin inside of those acinar cells within the pancreas, there's this enzyme in those cells that stops, uh, that inhibits the trypsin at that site. So schnauzers have three different mutations in their SPINK gene as opposed to other breeds. So they've got less inhibition of trypsin when it gets activated within the pancreas. So interesting, isn't it? Are we able to deliver those enzymes? Are we that clever in our pharmaceutical armory yet? No? No, we haven't isolated plasma. plasma. Yeah, exactly. So what you'd need to do, we can deliver it in plasma for sure. Um, but what you're delivering with that is all your coagulation factors and pro-coagulant, pro-inflammatory um, proteins as well as um, anti-inflammatory proteins. So we there's this theory now with plasma that you're adding fuel to the fire and it's not necessarily it's like worse outcomes if you give plasma with pancreatitis based on the studies. Um, so we haven't isolated the antitrypsin from the plasma to be able to give that in isolation. But what we actually need, like that's great in plasma, but we need it in the pancreas, don't mm. we? So it's, it's, we need it to be actually localised. So we don't have any way of delivering that um, where, it's, where it needs to go. Also, isn't it just like sort of dose dependent? It can only do 10%. And if, if there's more secretion, then, the pan, then it gets overwhelmed and then it can't. Yes, exactly. So we've got this balance between inflammation and compensatory anti-inflammatory mechanisms. And it's only when you kind of tip over into, you run out of the anti-inflammatory stuff mm. um, that you tip over into the inflammatory stuff. Mm. We need to bind it to glucose or insulin or something like that to get it into, yeah. 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 But then it's not going to go into the islet cells, the acinar cells. Exactly. So, so 2% mm. of the pancreas is going to be going like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, keep yeah, working on that one. <laughs> the rest will still be cross. I think you need to start, keep working on your uh, hypothesis there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're the main things. So we've got a systemic trypsin inhibitor. We've got a local trypsin inhibitor within the cells. We've got one-way flow through that pancreatic duct. And we've got the fact that these um, enzymes are stored as their pro-enzymes. They're not actually in the active form within the pancreas. So they're all things that the pancreas can do. Um, and then the other things... Um, all of these enzymes are less active in um, acidic environment. Well, I shouldn't say it's a neutral or acidic environment. So as soon as they hit the duodenum, where it's the bicarb rich, um, they're more active. So their sort of activation is inhibited by a neutral or acidic environment. So they're kind of more prone to being activated within the duodenum. 
Um, all right. Good. So that's the kind of physiology I wanted to cover. Does anybody else have anything they want to talk about as far as what the pain? <gasps> We've missed a big, thing, a big thing. The pancreatic function, sorry, going back to that. We've done digestive enzymes. What else does it do? Oh, Jeff, you're muted, I think. Secrete insulin and glucagon. Good, excellent. But just the exocrine pancreas. Is there any other function? Um, I missed the first part of this lecture. I'm sorry. I got the email just this morning. Um, so I've got pancreatic digestive enzymes. Um, does it produce bicarb as well, right? Oh, oh no! <laughs> Sorry, uh, <laughs> I think that's in the gastric something. I think uh, the gastric. I, some cells I, I gastric. thought there were some cells in the ducts somewhere of the pancreas that actually produces bicarb, Ooh. so it goes in with the digestive enzymes into the duodenum to to balance oh. all the acid coming from the stomach. Bile, the biliary, um, the biliary mucosa produces a whole heap of bicarb. Okay, but I'm not sure about the pancreas. Okay. But in theory, I mean, so cats, they're dumping into the same duct, right? Mm -hmm. So we've talked about this with the biliary system. So cats have got the bile duct and then it's going down to the duodenal papilla and the pancreatic duct slots in. So they've got this Y shape and just this only sphincter of body down here. And then there's nothing, whatever gets up into that duct will go into the pancreas and the gallbladder. Whereas dogs have got the two ducts that open separately. Um so cats have probably got a higher bicarb in their distal, like, duct, I guess. Yeah. Yep. But I'm not sure about dogs. Okay. Um, we didn't really cover anatomy, but let's keep going. I'm going to push you on the function of the pancreas. Um, does it have any roles in um, not, like, macronutrient absorption, but vitamin absorption? B12 absorption. Good. Why? It produces like something to uh, the transport or something yes. uh, for the B12. Thank yes. you. <laughs> yes. Well done. Yeah. Does anybody remember what it's called? How can I forget already? Like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> Wait till you're seven years down the track. Terrible. This is why I do this <laughs> to revise. <laughs> I should sit memberships every year at this rate. Yeah. <laughs> um, it starts with an I. What is the code? I don't know. Transporter. In, in, intrins Intrinsic factor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so I used to, I'm used to helping my kids with their homework. So. <laughs> Thank you. It's very, it makes me feel like I knew it all along when you say it that way. Yeah, yeah you got it. <laughs> um, so B12 can't be absorbed without being bound to this intrinsic factor. So the intrinsic factor comes out of the pancreas and goes along the intestine bound to the B12. And it's when it gets to the distal ileum, it gets absorbed by the intrinsic factor binding to something. That I can't remember the mechanism, but... Um, it's it, you can't absorb B12 with that intrinsic factor. Um, so in, for example, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and the function of the exocrine pancreas is digestion as well as this intrinsic factor, you know, what proportion of animals are B12 deficient? All of them? All cats, 80% of dogs. Wow. Okay. And that's measurably deficient. So, so yeah. that's like right lower, much lower than they would sit in health, I would say. Um, so really crucial in the absorption of, of B12, which is obviously a very important vitamin. Um, uh, they're the main functions I wanted to cover. And then anatomy was sort of talked about, about the differences between dogs and cats, the Y shape and the the ducks plugging in separately in the dogs um which just means that when they i won't go too much into it cats and dogs get different kinds of pancreatitis they're just 
cats don't follow the rules. Um, so how does pancreatitis develop? Because the, I mean, it's inflammation because this thing is activated, the uh, zymogens, they get activated within the pancreas itself. And then because it, the system gets overwhelmed, then it causes edema around and then it causes neutrophils to come in. And that's when something else happens. The acute necro, like that's what happens. Acute yeah. necrotizing pancreatitis. It's yeah. all a mishmash in my head. Ah, you've got it all though. You see, I'm not sure you got the order right, but you got all the points that are on my list, the neutrophils and the necro necrosis and the edema and the, um, so let's try and break this down. So first thing that happens is that trypsinogen is activated to trypsin in the pancreas. So we've overcome one of those protective mechanisms that inhibits that normally. So then you've got, we call, I love this word, autodigestion. So digestion of self. Um, by the trypsin. So the protein within the pancreas is broken down by the trypsin. And that's going to cause necrosis. So that's step number one, because the cells are just going to die. Mm. Cute dog, Bron. I've never met your dog before. Um, so then once you've got necrosis, then you get the cell infiltrates, neutrophils, macrophages, edema, then you get the changes that we see and recognize on ultrasound as the um, kind of pathognomonic kind of features of, of pancreatitis, that edema, swelling of the pancreas itself. I should say we're talking about acute necrotizing pancreatitis here with the kind of dramatic edema and stuff like that. Um, and then you're also getting some lipase causing some fat necrosis as well both in the pancreas and surrounds. Once we've got necrosis of those cells, where those zymogens start to leak out and the protective mechanisms are overwhelmed. Um, and we get cell infiltrates, inflammatory cytokine cascade developing, and the pancreas is really close to the liver, which is where interleukin-1 and interleukin-6 go to activate that systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So all of the cytokines start to really kind of ramp up. Um, so all those cytokines go straight out the portal circulation straight into the liver and it activates all those acute phase proteins and we get profound systemic inflammation with acute necrotizing pancreatitis um there are anti-inflammatory um activations as well but like Pooja um alluded to before you get a balance of anti-inflammatory and inflammatory and ultimately we want the anti-inflammatory to win but SIRS or systemic inflammatory response syndrome is where we overwhelm the anti-inflammatory component with the inflammatory component and then the infl inflammation goes completely unchecked by those anti-inflammatory cytokines and pathway um, so that's when we end up with um, systemic inflammation and um, <clears throat> excuse me, pyrexia, um, lung changes, kidney changes, end organ um, dysfunction, which I think we covered in the sepsis SERS section of the book. So I won't go too much into that. Does that make is sense? All, yeah, is all acute pancreatitis necrotizing? Yes. Yeah. yeah. In fact, all pancreatitis is necrotizing in that we have autodigestion and therefore necrosis occurring. It's just how much, basically, um, and how acute. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, acute pancreatitis. So in cats, do we see chronic or acute pancreatitis more commonly? I think when I went through school, it, like I, I think I have memory that they said cats don't get much acute. It's more chronic, but I think that's changed now. I think cats also, even now, I mean, cats get acute pancreatitis as well. Yeah, they certainly do get acute pancreatitis. It's not as easy to diagnose. I think is mm. probably the problem, and yeah. it's probably under recognized. But cats tend to hide their symptoms as well, so they don't get as acutely unwell 
when they've got acute illness as dogs do. Um, so certainly the stats sort of say that chronic pancreatitis is a more common cause of chronic vomiting and um, gastrointestinal signs or clinical signs than acute pancreatitis, but we certainly do see acute pancreatitis now. In Not now, we always have, yeah. but we're recognising it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about chronic pancreatitis? Does that happen often in dogs? I think acute is more common than chronic in dogs, but it does it does happen in dogs. Yeah. But chronic, exactly. Um, so with chronic pancreatitis, um, have you guys ever seen stats on um histo of just dogs that were euthanized for any cause, and on their pancreases? Um, I'm gonna just make sure I tell you this right, but it's really surprising. I think it's forty percent. Yeah of dogs have pancreatitis when they're euthanized because they're strays or whatever. These are just like all cause euthanasia. The incidence of regenerative nodules and pancreatic inflammation is um, like, yeah, 40 to 60%. I'm going to tell you one of the two. I just remember it was higher than, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> it's I, so, I found it so surprising. So this sort of concept of chronic pancreatitis, you know, we do our biopsies and we're like gold standard. I know we've got pancreatitis here, but actually most normal dogs have pancreatitis if you're judging gold standard, histo as gold standard. Um, so, so it's wondering not, whether it's clinically significant. Yes. They might have it, but so what? Yeah, exactly. And you sort of go, oh, this dog's got chronic vomiting and I've got the answer. It's chronic pancreatitis and that's the cause of its vomiting, but it might not be. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit discouraging. We always think we know what we're talking about and then something like this comes out. Um, oh, I can't find it. It's either 40 or 60, but it's a lot. Um, and similarly, regenerative nodules in pancreases are not uncommon at all. Um, so you sort of, because I do a lot of ultrasound, I sort of, and I like to interpret ultrasound, um, knowing what to look for as far as kind of markers of chronic pancreatitis is really important. So... I'm looking for a small, if I, with chronic pancreatitis, I'm looking for the size being either normal to small because with chronicity, we see fibrosis and we lose volume. We might have a little bit of edema, but we've offset that with some fibrosis. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see some nodules and I wouldn't be surprised to see the margin of the pancreas not being like nice straight line. Like it might undulate a little bit where we've got kind of sections of fibrosis um, and contraction. Um, in the pancreatic capsule so they're the sort of changes that i expect to see in a patient that had quite severe chronic pancreas and um, changes over a long period of time and in cats the duct that runs through the middle is often greater than three millimeters that's quite a sensitive marker for pancreatitis chronic pancreatitis in cats not so much dogs um, but when you see it you're like oh there it is Otherwise, it's very, um, the pancreas is very vague. It doesn't tell us much. Do you think the duct is dilated because going back to the anatomy, maybe there's some obstruction in that sort of common outlet and you've got cholangitis as well? Or... Yeah, and even not, you might have obstruction in the common outlet or you might have fibrosis in the pancreas itself. So maybe a little bit of contraction further up, like downstream from the where you're looking okay. because it's not uncommon when I look to see a dilated duct in the left limb, but not the right, mm. which would suggest more intrapancreatic kind of obstruction, okay. but I don't know what the mechanism is. Okay. Um, okay. Going, I'm jumping around a little bit. Sorry. Um, going back to dogs with chronic pancreatitis, um, what breeds are identified as predisposed to chronic pancreatitis? Is it Spaniels, Cocker Spaniels? Yeah, big one. You mentioned schnauzers earlier. Yeah, schnauzers are um, genetically predisposed to acute, um, according to Edinger, but they certainly have chronic pancreatitis as well. Um, any others for chronic? I don't know. I'm just thinking about the pathophys of pancreatitis in dogs and 
and I'm going to say fat dogs or breeds that are likely to be overweight, like labbies or daxies and stuff. I don't know. I'm just trying to. Yeah, it would make sense, sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Um, So the breeds that are listed, Border Collies, which I found surprising. Wow, yeah. And I always find it a little bit dangerous to sort of say, oh, these breeds are prone to chronic pancreatitis because the genetic populations that are written up in the studies are often not the genetic populations we're dealing with. So take it with a grain of salt. Mm. Um, cockers, for sure. We see a lot of cockers and another too deep, sorry, fellowship level. Um, but the gene that predisposes cockers to um, pancreatitis is actually linked to the gene that predisposes cockers to autoimmune hemolytic anemia so the cockers are really prone to quite aggressive or severe anemia and we certainly see that in our australian cockers and we certainly see chronic pancreatitis in our australian cockers and another interesting thing there's been a paper come out recently that outcome in cockers is improved with pancreatitis is improved with prednisolone so it suggests more of a true acute autoimmune um disease rather than um an auto like accidental auto digestion or other mechanism so cockers are their own story um but we've also got cabbies and boxes and border collies in that the chronic list and then acute schnauzer 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 basically and then often terriers but i think it's probably because they tend to be fat like you said so that segues nicely into our etiology of pancreatitis what are the triggers of the pancreatitis episode fatty meal i mean it's not fatty meal it's not fatty meal yeah um, and what is the so is it what is it about a fatty meal that triggers pancreatitis Mm-hmm. No. What are okay? Let's park that and move on to other causes of pancreatitis because Alison said one earlier. Being obese. Yeah. Yeah. Causes what change on your biochemistry that might predispose? Hyper triglyceridemia. Good. Exactly. So fatty meal and being obese both cause hypertriglyceridemia, which is the actual mechanism or etiology of the triggering pancreatitis is that um, chronic as well or just acute pancreatitis uh both um they don't really know what the mechanism is but they think that um there's two theories if i remember this right one is that hypertriglyceride uh, hypertriglyceridemia causes hyperviscosity and the pancreas is so susceptible to ischemia that if it's not getting adequate blood flow, it gets annoyed. And then the second theory is that I think the circulating blood triggers lipase activation within the pancreas rather than within the lumen of the, um, I guess, the duodenum, which triggers a little bit of autodigestion and then the trypsin gets activated um but neither of them have been very well proven other triggers trauma good so post-op post-op is the most common we see um others there's infection as well mm-hmm. any examples in cats like cholangitis will do it cats yeah cats. Mm-hmm. So enteric bacteria. Um, if you look at the pancreas of cats, 13 out of 46, I think that's like a third, will have uh, cats with pancreatitis, I should say, will have bacteria in their pancreas. Um, any other infections? You have some sort of parasitic infection, I guess. Ooh, yeah. Maybe. I'm thinking of a fluke or something. I don't, I've never seen one, but it's in my mind somewhere. Seen one? In, I, I've never seen one full stop, but um, uh, I think they like the liver, but theoretically yeah. they're migrating through the region, so I wouldn't suppose They there. got lost. Yeah. Um, cats, there's one protozoal infection. I just gave it away. Sorry. Oh, toxo. Uh, to- toxo, actually. Toxo. Yeah. 
Um, Toxo likes to get into the pancreas, but very, it would be, unusual. if you had a case that was exclusively pancreatitis, I wouldn't go doing a Toxo titer. Mm. When Toxo is systemic, it's often in the pancreas, but it's also in the liver, the muscles, the lungs. So the, it's very rarely isolated to the pancreas. So And that, that's in the acute phase of the disease. Yeah, so it's when they're really unwell with it. Um, and I'm assuming Neospora would be the same for dogs, but I haven't actually seen it. I haven't identified it in the pancreas because they're so bloody sick and can't breathe. So I'm not looking at their pancreas. Um, FIP in theory, but um, we'll put that on the list for everything. Um, any other triggers? I guess shock. Maybe that went with trauma, but anything that's going to cause ischemia, as you said before. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Um, so any reduction in blood flow to the pancreas it's such a sensitive organ um so hypoxia you like i've never i've recognized like hypoxic you know renal cerebral liver but you are just putting pancreas on that list pretty much every time exactly yeah right. and the thing is with the critical care patients we've seen like the post arrest patients for example like prime examples um, they get all of the other kind of organs dysfunction first. And if they don't die of that, the pancreatitis becomes a problem day two to five. <laughs> yeah. so if you can get them through that first part, you're going to be dealing with pancreatitis probably. So then hypotension also will do it, okay? Yeah. Like it will yeah, yeah. Particularly if it's acute. I think the body's pretty good at compensating when it mm -hmm. happens slowly, but particularly um, under anesthetic like a sudden onset hypotensive episode for sure. Um, you mediated? Good. Talkers. Yeah, absolutely. Would you um, just do talkers there? And what about cattos? You know, a lot of cats have non-suppurative, as we said, you know, we have suppurative cholangiohepatitis and then mm -hmm. we get that in the pancreas. Yeah. You know, we give them prednisolone. Mm -hmm. um if we don't think it's separative and they get better is that immune mediated or is it just yeah it is yeah, yeah. i mean it's part of a the triaditis syndrome in cats which is i mean etiologically poorly understood mm. and it may be that we've got increased bacterial circulation through the biliary and pancreatic systems but there is the immune system is mediating the inflammation whether it's reactive or appropriate or inappropriate yeah, yeah. exactly yeah so it is immune mediated. It may not be autoimmune, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, particularly in cats and cockers. CCs, cats and cockers. Ooh, good way to remember it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, there's another trigger uh, that I don't know how to hint without just giving it away. Should I just tell you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so certain drugs. Uh, yes. Yeah, which one? Yeah. Azorpyrin, I think. Yes, good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And red, maybe. Potassium bromide. <laughs> Potassium bromide, good. Mm -hmm. They're the big ones. There's like a couple of other, like the vinca alkaloids, l asparaginase, organophosphates, but um, very uncommonly. But certainly one of my supervisors, um, who <coughs> most people know, and he's probably told this to a lot of people, Graham Swinney used to say that um, potassium bromide is like poking the pancreas nonstop. It's so irritating for the pancreas. Um, so certainly a risk with um, drugs. All right. Um, so there's one other trigger, um, particularly in cats. It's hypercalcemia. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't understand what the mechanism is of that, but it's on the list of causes of pancreatitis. Um, but interestingly, when we have pancreatitis, very severe pancreatitis with saponification of fat, what might our calcium do on our blood tests? Low. It'll be low. low. Exactly, yeah. The low calcium is actually a negative prognostic indicator in pancreatitis because it suggests really profound fat changes. Um, uh, but apparently hypercalcemia can trigger it. So different thing, but calcium and pancreatitis. Um, all right. As far as treatment of pancreatitis, I think it's 
supportive care. I mean, everybody, I don't want to spend too much time doing that. Does anybody have any specific things they want to talk about? I was wondering, does the duodenum get um, involved in any um, autodigestion in pancreatitis? Well, not autodigestion, but does it, um, do you get problems with the duodenal lining because you have so much activation or does it really confine to the pancreas? Uh, it's a good question and I wouldn't say it's confined to the, to the pancreas. We see quite profound peritonitis in the region surrounding the pancreas and the duodenum is like collateral damage in there. Um, so we see thickening of the duodenal wall. We see, particularly on ultrasound, um, the mucosa being more grey, which suggests more cells in there. We certainly see mechanical or um, functional ileus of the duodenum and you know i think most of us have seen pancreatitis where they've got this huge like stomach full of fluid because mm. the stomach's just not emptying at all like just that pyloric and duodenal region are very inflamed um and that's usually manifests as ileus so yeah so I would you say. might if you see that you might want to use prokinetics and um proton pump inhibitors for a positive esophagitis secondary to massive stomach or... oh, that's a good question um i wouldn't usually use proton pump inhibitors reason being is if you increase the ph of the stomach it actually delays gastric emptying mm, so that, right. the, the high ph in the stomach is one of the things that gets this it triggers gastric motility um so unless they were showing signs of if if they were gurging a lot and i thought it was a very high risk of aspiration then yes i would but that would be a very much case by case recommendation yeah. i would be more likely to put an n g tube in yep. and drain the stomach although that again that's controversial because you're draining a lot of electrolytes out of there mm -hmm. um but prokinetics 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 mm -hmm. get that moving yep yeah um you use a bit of clopramide then as well like you know we all reach for serenia as an anti-emetic mm -hmm. but just for that sphincter you know if you're worried mm -hmm. about esophagitis and you want a bit more prokinetic is that yeah i use right? any any ileus on ultrasound i'll recommend metoclopramide as long as they're not obstructed mm. um just bearing in mind metoclopramide works as an anti-emetic at lower doses it doesn't have prokinetic effects so you get quite high so you do have to be quite aggressive with your dose to get the prokinetic effect okay good um and as far as <clears throat> decision to use antibiotics and or steroids, I mean, we don't want to use either of them if they, you know, if there's no infection, we don't want the antibiotics. And, yeah. and on the other hand, if we don't want to use steroids if it's septic. So how do we make that decision? Um, that's such a good question. And again, very case by case. There's very few situations in acute pancreatitis where I would use either, pan uh, either antibiotics or steroids. I would use steroids if I had a cocker and we were two weeks down the track and we just couldn't get like, a, or a cat um, and we couldn't get control of the inflammation. We couldn't get return to appetite and we were still doing very intensive supportive care. I would potentially use steroids, but I'd use a pretty short course and wean them. They potentially do it three days and, and then sort of see what happens. Um, uh, and antibiotics, I would only use if I had um, a cyst or an abscess or evidence of infection. So usually ultrasound guided decision making. Um, it's tricky because we know that there's bacteria in these pancreases and gallbladders. But we also know that if we disrupt the microbiome too much, we're going to impact motility. We're going to impact return to appetite. Um, we've got all, and we're going to have relapse of diarrheal episodes and things if we use antibiotics. So there's sort of things that make me think, oh, let's hold off if we can. And it doesn't change outcome according to the stats in the vast majority of cases. Uh, okay, we've got 10 minutes. Um, do you want to move on to EPI or do you want to do more like diagnosis of pancreatitis? EPI now, I think. EPI, yeah, I agree. I think every we've talked the CPLI to death. Everybody knows its limitations. Um, okay, so what breeds are predisposed to EPI? German Shepherds. 
Good. Yeah, they're the big ones. Uh, boxes? Uh, maybe. No. I don't know. That might be personal experience. <laughs> yeah, it might be your the gen- genetic pool you're dealing with. <laughs> um, there's one more, one more big one that's quite sort of worldwide. Um, they have very long fur, sometimes called lassie. Oh, <laughs> Rough poly. <laughs> yes, good. Thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so coll- collies and German shepherds are most common, but it can be any breed and you, and species like cat or dog. It can. It, um, it's one of those diseases that you've seen these patients for like chronic diarrhea. You've seen them ten times, and then you go, "Oof, should have done a TLI back then," <laughs> um, because it doesn't. You always okay. What are the clinical signs of EPI? Weight loss, yeah. big appetite, mm-hmm. stool changes maybe late in the disease, voluminous, pale, yeah. fetid feces. Yeah. And this is that late in disease is the key thing, like particularly as general practitioners, you're seeing them with stool changes when they first start, not when they've completely run out of digestive enzymes. Mm. So it's often in hindsight that you go, oh, mm. that was so severe. Um, so it can be hard to diagnose when you're seeing them chronically. It's much easier if you sort of get them referred 10, after 10 visits to the other vet and they've got terrible diarrhea. Um, uh, if you did histopathology on an EPI pancreas, what would you see? Ooh. Probably atrophy of the... Um, well, yeah, probably atrophy of the main substance of the pancreas. Yep. Uh, exactly. So it's, it's the acinar cells just atrophy and are replaced with fibrotic or fatty tissue, fibro fatty infiltrates. Um, so the pancreas is small if you look at it on an ultrasound or histopathologically or surgically, presumably, for people that do that. Um, uh, so decreased volume and um, no inflammation, interestingly. Um, although I would say that's quite a cat, that that's quite a dog statement. Cats. What is the etiopathogenesis of EPI in cats? Chronic pancreatitis. Yeah, exactly. So you're going to get a little bit of inflammation in there. Um, okay. How are we going to diagnose it? TLA. 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 <clears throat> what if your TLI comes back borderline? I think in the German Shepherd, if your index of suspicion is high and if TLI is like less than 2.5, is it something like that? Then like you have the diagnosis. Whereas that's not so slam dunk in other breeds, is yeah. my understanding. Um, what is what does TLI stand for? Yeah, good, excellent. So, if you've just eaten a meal, would you expect your trypsin like immune reactivity, so your digestive enzyme levels, to be higher or lower than in a fasting state? Higher, higher, higher. And if you're trying to detect a disease of deficiency in those enzymes, are you better off? to do it fasted to prove your point or postprandially okay more, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly yeah so you're you're much more likely to get a false like just in the normal range and a postprandial sample but if you do it fasted if you've got a high index of susp- i mean you're never going to get a low level in a normal dog so you just do it fasted essentially so do you mean you actually make, you tell your patients to be fasted if you're going to do this test? Huh? Yeah. Okay. yeah, exactly. I don't, because it's, it's really expensive actually. Mm. Yeah. It's a few hundred dollars at least. Yeah. Um, so I want to make it count. And often these are people that are frustrated because they've been dealing with mountains of stool for <laughs> quite a while usually. Um, so I just, my, I don't want to do a, I don't want to get a false positive, a false yeah. like negative. I want to prove my point. Um, when you get, so you've got 
inability to digest nutrients, how does that cause diarrhea? Mal digestion. Good, exactly. But how does that cause diarrhea? Osmosis. Yes, good. Oh, yeah. Excellent. So those nutrients suck water into the lumen of the bowel and nothing's been absorbed. So you're going to have increased volume going out than you had going in or well, very little has been absorbed. Um, so mountains of poo. What? So you need to replace the digestive enzymes. What other changes might be present in the bowel of these dogs, given that we've completely changed the luminal con um, contents particularly distally when most of those macronutrients have been absorbed? Bacteria and fungal residents. Good, exactly. They've got the weirdest commensals in their guts, these dogs. In, mm. you know, in the colon, there shouldn't be any kind of digestible nutrients, macronutrients, and there is. Mm. So they've got completely messed up um, microbiomes. So sometimes they need a little bit of corrective action in their microbiomes to go along with their pancreatic enzyme supplementation. Um, what else are they deficient in? Corbiotic. B12. Good. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, so really important that we're supplementing not just pancreatic enzymes, but B12 lifelong. They don't have the capacity to absorb um, B12. Um, so I have a question on that, Anna. Yeah. Do you, when you say lifelong, because they mm -hmm. can't absorb it, do we have to give parental yeah. then? We can't give oral. It's a really good question. So 98% of cobalamin is absorbed via that intrinsic path in, intrinsic factor and distal ileal absorption pathway. There's one to 2% that's absorbed without, like passively, without that kind of lock and key kind of thing. Um, so if you give um an oral cobalamin supplement and you give it at 100 times the normal intake you will get adequate absorption so most of the cobalamin supplements are designed to overcome that failure of normal kind of pathway absorption so they're 100 time concentrated um to make sure that you've got adequate um a, a adequate ab amount to absorb it yep um I keep an eye on it though, because you are kind of pushing the capabilities of the bowel. Um, mm -hmm. So doing B12 levels where you can. Is that so? Cabalazorb is sufficient. It is. That's a really good one. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the the new one that they've got, the enterogenic. One, Perfect um, for API. Then yeah. yeah, it's got the cabalamin as well as the probiotic, so it's quite a good choice for these guys. Do you send your clients home with sub Q and give it weekly or twice weekly or something like that? You know, yeah. is that I a use reasonable? weekly protocol if I'm going to go parenteral. Um, and I do with these guys, it's a very frustrating disease and everybody's frustrated at the start, at the beginning of the diagnosis. And you, the, have, have either, any of you guys managed to your um, EPI patients? Not really. Yes. Uh, one. Yeah, it's it's definitely not a one treatment protocol fits all. Um, so you start on pancreatic enzymes and then you have to, some dogs do better with them sprinkled on top of the food. Some dogs do better with them given 20 minutes before the food. Some dogs need it stirred through really consistently. Some dogs do better with actual pancreas in their food from the butcher. And some dogs do better with Creon um so there's lots of different protocols or ways to supplement it and every dog needs different amounts of enzymes and delivered different ways so it's it is a bit of a frustrating disease and the creon's expensive creon is my choice of digestive enzyme um there's a really good website it's um tli number four dogs i think no epi for dogs sorry um dot com and it's got a whole heap of different treatment protocols and i've found often giving that to the owners and saying go nuts just try stuff try it for a week if if you're not getting good results move on to the next one it kind of empowers them to not feel like they have to come back and pay a consult fee every time 
Um, and it's excellent. Like I'm using that to make my recommendations. So they might as well just it up themselves. How are you gauging response in a week, like from the owner? Is it just the stools that you're going by or because yeah. weight gain wouldn't happen in a week? Well, oh God, it can be quite dramatic once because they're so ravenous. Yeah. Once they can hold on to their nutrients. Um, so yeah, in that first kind of four weeks or so, I do a weekly check-in even just a weigh-in and a b12 shot or something like that mm -hmm. just make sure that everybody's happy and improving and then after that i just make sure that the owners were keeping an eye on the weight and keeping me informed mm -hmm. all right we might have to wrap up um thank you all thank you thank, thank you, you. Um, Bye, everybody thank Bye, you everyone. No worries. We'll see you then. That was terrific. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. See ya. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Jonathan.